Senator McCain and the Republican Party in St. Paul, Minnesota. 16 U.S. soldiers have died in Iraq after being electrocuted. Next, a House hearing looks into those deaths and the electrical systems at U.S. facilities in Iraq. Witnesses include a representative from KBR, a contractor in the country. Henry Waxman chairs the Oversight Committee. This is about two hours. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. Our soldiers and their families make enormous sacrifices for our country. And they make these sacrifices understanding the deadly risks that they may face. Since the Iraq War began over five years ago, over 4,000 servicemen and women have been killed and over 30,000 injured. But no soldier should die while relaxing in a swimming pool or washing a vehicle or taking a shower. Yet that is exactly what happened in Iraq. As a result of widespread electrical deficiencies throughout U.S. military facilities, our soldiers have been shocked and killed needlessly. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine why this happened and to determine whether the actions taken by the Defense Department and its largest contractor in Iraq, KBR, are sufficient to prevent these senseless deaths. There was no shortage of warnings about the electrical dangers in Iraq, just a shortage of will to do the right thing by our troops. In 2004, the U.S. Army uh, Safety Center issued a report warning about widespread electrical hazards throughout Iraq. The report explained that five U.S. soldiers were, had been electrocuted in Iraq that year alone. According to the report, one of these soldiers was found dead lying on a shower room floor with burn marks on his body. The report attributed his death to electricity that traveled from the water heater through the metal pipes to the shower head. The 2004 report warned commanders that they must require contractors to properly ground electrical systems. But despite these warnings, few actions were taken by Pentagon leadership or KBR officials. In February 2007, the Defense Contracting Management Agency reported that there had been 283 fires at facilities maintained by KBR in a five-month period from August 2006 through January 2007. These fires burned down the largest dining facility in Iraq, and they killed at least two soldiers. The Defense Contract Management Agency report described the widespread electrical deficiencies as a, quote, major challenge, end quote, and the primary safety threat theater-wide. It also warned that some contractors connected to KBR were not following the basic safety principles. But Defense Department officials again took no action. In a May 2008 email, a DCMA official warned his superiors that the lack of action with regard to any corrective action or increased surveillance results in a direct liability for our agency, end quote. In his testimony today, Jeffrey Parsons, the executive director of the Army Contracting Command, says that the De Defense Department now recognizes that, quote, neither LOGCAP nor DCMA have sufficient skill sets or expertise to perform adequate oversight of electrical work being performed by KBR, end quote. Well, that's a remarkable admission. We will ask why it took the Defense Department four years to realize that it lacks the skill and expertise to oversee KBR. In total, 19 U.S. military and contractor personnel may have been killed as a result of electric electrocution or faulty wiring in Iraq. These young heroes might still be alive today if the department had done the proper oversight. One of the individuals who died by electrocution is Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth, a decorated Army Ranger and Green Beret who was electrocuted in his shower on January 2, 2008. Army investigators concluded that he was killed when his, when his water pump overheated, thereby causing the failure of the breaker switch 
capacitor and internal, and internal fuse. A preliminary report by the Defense Department Inspector General on Sergeant Maseth's death was provided to the Committee on Men Monday and leaked to the press yesterday. This IG report absolves the military and KBR of responsibility in the death and asserts that there was no credible evidence that they knew of electrical problems with Staff Sergeant Maseth's shower. As part of the Oversight Committee's investigation, we obtained many new documents about Staff Sergeant Maseth's death. When we described these documents to the Inspector General's staff yesterday, they said they believed they did not have this new information. Now, we do not know whether the Inspector General failed to ask for the right documents, which would be a stain on the Inspector General's work, or whether the documents were withheld from the Inspector General, which would call into question the motives of the Department and KBR. But we do know that these documents appear to contradict the Inspector General's findings. My staff has prepared an analysis of the new information about Staff Sergeant Maseth's death, and I ask that this staff analysis and the documents it cites be made part of today's hearing record. There is no objection, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, that will be the order. The documents obtained by the committee include work orders from, from the facility where Staff Sergeant Maseth was electrocuted. These work orders appear to show that Sergeant Justin Hummer, who occupied Staff Sergeant Maseth's quarters until October 2007, repeatedly warned KBR and the military about electrical shocks in the shower. According to Sergeant Hummer, he was shocked four or five times in the shower between June and October of 2007. On at least one occasion, he had to use a wooden handle to turn the shower nozzle because the electrical current was so strong. If these work orders are accurate, they show that in July 2007, six months before Staff Sergeant Maseth was electrocuted, KBR may have installed the water pump that ultimately malfunctioned resulting in his death. The electrical problems that led to Staff Sergeant Maseth's death were not new problems. In February 2007, KBR conducted an assessment of the facility where he worked. The KBR assessment found major electrical problems, including with the building's main circuit panel. These problems were confirmed in a second KBR assessment prepared after Staff Sergeant Maseth's death, the report found that the majority of electrical panels in the complex are in disrepair and require replacement, and that a majority of the electrical systems are, quote, in complete disarray, end quote. The serious electrical hazards are finally getting some attention. KBR recommended in March that troops immediately evacuate at least six buildings at the compound where Staff Sergeant Maseth was killed because the electrical conditions in all buildings make them uninhabitable for safety and health reasons. Today we will ask why it took so long for KBR and the Defense Department to protect our troops from these dangerous conditions. We are going to ask our witnesses tough questions about the documents we have obtained and we will try to understand both the specific cases and the broad systemic problems at issue. I know that one of our witnesses recently retired and did not have to appear today. I know that others flew in from Iraq for this hearing, and I want to thank all of you for your cooperation with this committee's investigation. Before we call on our witnesses, I want to recognize Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to be brief because I know we have Senator Casey. We are happy to have you here today. Uh, um, Today's hearing will examine injuries and deaths of military personnel resulting from deficiencies in the electric system at facilities occupied by our forces in Iraq. There is no question every one of these accidental deaths is a tragedy. There is also no doubt the electric infrastructure in Iraq is a mess and presents a constant danger to everyone there. Further, there is little question the electric systems within many of the facilities occupied by our personnel are significantly below U.S. standards. In many cases, pursuant to command decisions, we are forced to use buildings built and wired during the regime, the regime of Saddam. Apparently, the regime had the same disdain for building codes it showed to U.N. resolutions. 
The first step in preventing injuries and death from electrocution is to do a better job training our soldiers to appreciate the inherent dangers of living, working and fighting in the middle of a third world electrical infrastructure. These are considerations you don't often worry about in the United States and other first world countries. Our soldiers are trained and equipped to deal with the inevitably dangerous environment of Iraq and other war zones, but are they sufficiently prepared to understand the dangers of ungrounded high voltage electric current? As you said, Mr. Chairman, on January 2, 2008, Army Staff Sergeant Ryan D. Maseth was electrocuted while showering at his Special Forces compound in, in uh, Baghdad. Sergeant Maseth was electrocuted when the ungrounded water pump on the roof of his facilities failed and electrified the water distribution pipes. The safety shutoff also failed, apparently because tar from recent roof repairs fouled the circuit breaker. Sergeant Maseth's death is one of 16 electrocutions identified by investigators from the Department of Defense's Office of Inspector General. The accidental deaths have occurred under myriad circumstances. IG investigators determined eight of the cases involved contact with power lines during military or construction operations. Four cases were caused by improperly grounded or faulty electric equipment. The three remaining cases involved individuals attempting to repair faulty electric equipment. These deaths raise the question of whether our soldiers are properly trained to be aware and vigilant. For example, in May 2004, a soldier was electrocuted after trying to use a shower that was taken out of service for maintenance reasons. It was locked and the wiring disconnected, but a tired soldier looking for some clean water and comfort put the shower back into service with tragic results. Another unfortunate incident involved a service member who died after being clipped by a low-hanging power line while atop a seven-ton truck. Better communication and safety awareness training may have prevented these deaths. I think it would have prevented these deaths. These accidents are troubling, occurring under a variety of circumstances in different locations throughout Iraq. They have occurred in facilities such as forward operating bases and camps, along power lines, atop towers, while traveling in vehicles and outside tents. Fatalities have occurred in connection with servicing generators, communication equipments, radar equipment, lighting systems and air conditioning units. According to the IG, these unfortunate incidents had no correlation with each other in terms of causal factors other than the need for better safety standards and practices in an inherently unsafe environment. So based on what we know, uh, it is uh, premature to attribute electric incidents of fires just, just to contractor performance. And the fa familiar contractor blame uh, it doesn't make soldiers safe uh, by themselves but we need to look at it and understand it further. It is true that the death of Sergeant Maseth uh, occurred in a facility maintained by KBR, the former Halliburton subsidiary that provides most of the logistical support for our forces in Iraq. Uh, the contract calls only for repairs when requested by the military unit, and we will learn more about this as we move uh, through the hearing today. An internal report by the IG on the Maseth tragedy found uh, no evidence, uh, no credible evidence uh, that representatives from KBR or DCMA were aware of imminent life-threatening hazards prior to the electrocution, but other aspects of the incident are in litigation. And this committee sh should uh, tread carefully so that we don't interfere with prejudice into that. This hearing should also help raise awareness of important safety issues affecting our soldiers, sailors and Marines abroad. Any death of deployed personnel by electrocution in theater should be promptly and thoroughly investigated. All factors contributing to unsafe conditions should be immediately remedied. At times, this involves making sure contractors do what DOD pays them to do. It will always mean doing everything possible to increase occupational safety training and awareness for those we send to do the most unsafe thing imaginable, and that is fight a war. Thank you. Uh, let me ask unanimous consent that Representative Brady and Altmeyer be permitted to uh, sit with us in our hearing today. They are not members of the, uh, of the committee, but we want to welcome them and, uh, and their interest in this subject. I am pleased to welcome uh, Senator Bob Casey to give a statement to the committee. Senator Casey, who represents the family of Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth, has been actively involved in these issues in the Senate, and I thank him for being here and for his testimony today. Senator, uh, this committee is unusual in that every witness that testifies before us does so under oath, and uh, we would like to ask you if you would rise and hold you up your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate you answered in the affirmative. Uh, we are pleased to have you here and, uh, and to recognize you for uh, such statement as you wish to make. 
There's a button on the base of the mic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the privilege that I have to testify today before this committee and for your leadership on this issue. I want to thank you and thank Ranking Member Davis for this uh, opportunity, and especially for the commitment that you've made to find the truth, uh, the truth as it relates to the death of Ryan Maseth, uh, as well as the other soldiers and others who have lost their lives because of this problem we've had in Iraq. And I want to thank uh, other members of the committee who are here. I know that uh, uh, Jason Altmaier from Pennsylvania, who, who as well uh, represents uh, this family, uh, is here with us t today. And I'm really here for a number of reasons, but I think the principal reason I'm sitting here today, and maybe the principal reason that many of us are sitting here today, is because of the courage of a number of people, but in particular, the courage and the uh, determination that uh, Cheryl Harris has shown to do two things, really. One, obviously, uh, as a mother, as a member of a family who lost someone tragically in Iraq, to get answers, to get the truth about what happened to her son. Uh, no one, no one would, uh, would expect anything less of her. But she's also been uh, so committed to finding uh, the truth about this, so it doesn't happen to any other family. Over and over again, she has emphasized that. And when you think about all the ways that a, a soldier can die in battle, die on the battlefield, no one would ever imagine. And I think that the question, one of the major questions that hangs over this hearing and this uh, tragedy and the series of tragedies is why should a soldier be put at risk when he's taking a shower? or when he's washing a Humvee, or doing the, the things that uh, soldiers uh, do in their daily lives when they're not on the battlefield, when they're not uh, under fire. And as you s said, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ryan Maseth is a native of Shaler, Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania, a decorated Army Ranger in Green Beret. And when he was killed, he didn't die of enemy fire. But he was electrocuted uh, simply by taking a shower. His mother, Cheryl Harris, was first told by Army officials that Ryan died because he took an electrical appliance into the shower. Only after further digging did she learn that he died because an improperly grounded water pump produced an electrical current in Ryan's shower. And it's because of her passion and drive to find the truth uh, that I and others are here today. What she deserves and what every family deserves is very simple, an honest explanation of what led to the death of her child and accountability, accountability for those whose actions may have, may have contributed to an unnecessary death. We are, I believe, at the beginning of what should be a comprehensive inquiry. We have many more questions at this time than answers. Multiple actors, including the Defense Department, private contractors and others may bear varying levels of responsibility, and we should not leap to presume guilt by anyone. But it is important that we pursue this matter wherever it may lead. I wrote in my initial letter to Secretary Gates last month that we need to know, quote, what steps the Department of Defense has taken to ensure that no more American men or women serving in Iraq suffer needless deaths by electrocution due to faulty wiring or negligent maintenance. Mr. Chairman, just a, a, a quick summary of some of, the, some of the history here, some of which you've already outlined. You cited uh, testimony and evidence that indicates that in October of 2004, only 18 months after the United States entered Iraq, the Army published a safety bulletin describing electrocutions as a, quote, killer of soldiers, unquote. Frank Trent, T-R-E-N-T, a safety specialist with the Army Corps of Engineers was quoted in the report uh, this as follows, in part, quote, we've had, we've had several shocks and showers and near misses here in Baghdad as well as other parts of the country. As we install temporary and permanent power on our projects, we must ensure we require our contracts to properly ground electrical systems, unquote. So said a safety specialist with the Army Corps of Engineers in October of 04. And as you cited, Mr. Chairman, between June and October 07, 
Sergeant First Class Justin Hummer, residing at the same palace complex where Ryan Maseth would later live. During this time period, uh, Mr. Hummer reports being shocked in the shower at least four times and submits a work order at that time, each time for an appropriate repair to be made. And then finally, on January the 2nd, 2008, Sergeant Maseth uh, steps into the shower and was electrocuted. His body, burnt and smoldering, is discovered at that time by a fellow soldier who himself is then severely shocked due to a lingering current. We were initially told that 12 Americans had died due to electrocution deaths in Iraq. On July the 8th, General David Petraeus, in response to a question that I submitted to him, stated, in fact, that 13, not 12, 13 Americans, 11 soldiers, two contractor employees, died by electrocution. When I met with Mr. William Utt, the President and CEO of KBR last Friday, he told me that KBR believes that 15 Americans have died by electrocution. Finally, just in the last 24 to 48 hours, the Department of Defense Inspector General is reporting 16 non-combat electrocutions in Iraq since 2003. So we have to get to the bottom of what that number is. Mr. Chairman, when I met with the KBR CEO on Friday, he told me that KBR does not bear responsibility for Ryan Mesa's death because KBR allegedly was operating at the complex in Baghdad under the so-called Level B contract engagement. Under this type of contract, Mr. Rutt uh, asserted that KBR technicians were responsible for servicing problems brought to their attention by the Army and not given the broader task of preventive maintenance and proactively identifying problems as a Level A contract responsibility would have required. We don't know what the truth is there. Just because someone asserts what their responsibility was doesn't make it so. Uh, we need to know more about Level B and Level A, but especially what Level B meant. Uh, I've sent letters to both Mr. Rutt and the Pentagon to ascertain the facts. But it does not explain why, even after four separate work orders were filed in a matter of months on the same shower, why that shower was never fixed and why Ryan Maseth was electrocuted in that same shower. It's my hope today that this hearing will begin to shed further light on this question and other questions as well. I look forward to reviewing what the Defense Department Inspector General has to say. I was, however, yesterday disappointed that the Pentagon's chief spokesman at his daily briefing made an unprompted statement questioning the rationale for this hearing and implying that partisan politics are involved in this hearing. The United States Congress should not apologize for carrying out one of its core functions as envisioned by the framers of our Constitution, oversight of the executive branch. When they, di they died under differing circumstances, we know that these Americans and possibly more died of electrocutions in Iraq. Sixteen deaths do not make for isolated incidents or random occurrences. They constitute a pattern and are a genuine danger to our men and women serving in Iraq. As this danger continues to this very day, my office have heard, has heard from several active duty soldiers who report that as recently as three weeks ago, soldiers in Iraq continue to receive electrical shocks on a regular basis as they carry out their daily activities, including taking showers. Electric shocks are not the only danger produced by faulty wiring. There have been hundreds and hundreds of electrical fires at U.S. military facilities throughout Iraq since 2003. The Defense Department itself acknowledged almost 300 electrical fires in one five-month period between, uh, uh, June, or between 2006 and 2007. In June of 2000, uh, June the 25th, I should say, a faulty light fixture sparked a blaze that destroyed 10 buildings in a U.S. encampment outside Fallujah. Thank God there were no casualties, but members of the uh, Lima Company 3rd Battalion 6 Marine Regiment lost their entire possessions. They've been forced to write home and ask for donations to replace personal items. Mr. Chairman, I want to conclude with this. I'm not here, nor is anyone here, to point fingers, but simply to demand the truth. We're not here to prejudge the culpability of KBR, the Defense Contract Management Agency, the U.S. Army, or any other entity. The Congress must proceed with an open and transparent investigation. 
but Cheryl Harris and the loved ones of at least 15, maybe more, other Americans deserve answers. They need to know why faulty wiring in Iraq has been highlighted time and again as a major safety hazard going back to as early as uh, 2004, but little or no action has been taken. The American people and these families have a right to know the truth. We arrive in, in America at the truth by asking tough questions and demanding honest and complete answers. Our system of justice is, by its very nature, adversarial. We know that the truth doesn't fall like raindrops, clear raindrops from the sky. It must be elicited from individuals or unearthed in documents or other evidence. The only way to bring about justice is to get the truth. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the privilege of appearing before this hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Casey. I agree with you. It's our responsibility to get to the truth. And I'm amazed that someone would consider this uh, in any way partisan. Uh, it's uh, ironic to hear the people that should have been the, uh, doing the oversight within the military uh, who uh, are saying that they did the best they could and the contractor saying the best he did, uh, they did, he did the best he could. And then uh, as we, Congress looks at it, they say, well, if you look at it, it must be partisan. Uh, one of the best ways to keep people honest is to make sure that we get to the truth and that people know the truth is going to come out, not so much uh, because we want to uh, blame people, but because we want these problems corrected. I, too, met with Cheryl Harris, and uh, I uh, know of her commitment uh, to make sure that what she suffered with the loss of her son doesn't happen to anyone else. And I congratulate you as her senator and Congressman Altmaier as her representative in the House for insisting on this investigation, insisting on this hearing, and insisting on knowing the facts not with any other purpose but to get the facts so that uh, this sort of thing will never happen again. I thank you for being here. I want, Mr. Davis, do you have any comments? Well, um, Senator Casey, we very much appreciate thank your you being here and your leadership on there. And I just want to reiterate what the Chairman said. This is not partisan politics. Uh, we support this hearing, and I think we would be remiss and even negligent if we didn't follow through uh, and investigate this, something the executive branch has really not seen fit to follow through on. Uh, if the executive uh, branch doesn't want to get to the bottom of this, uh, this committee certainly will. We appreciate your efforts on this and we'll continue to work with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. With the indulgence of the other members, we'd like to move to the second uh, panel. Thank you very much, Senator, for being Thank here. You. I want to now call forward the following uh, witnesses for the DCMA, uh, Charlie E. Williams, Jr., the Director of the Defense Contract Management Agency, Keith Ernst, the former director of the Defense Contract Management Agency. He retired from that position in May 2008. Uh, from the Army, Jeffrey P. Parsons, the executive director of the U.S. Army Contracting Command. From the Defense Department Inspector General, uh, Gordon Hedell, acting inspector general at the Department of Defense. And he's accompanied by Don Horseman, the deputy inspector general for policy and oversight. And from KBR, Thomas Bruni, who is uh, KBR's theater engineer and construction manager for Iraq. We're, we're pleased to have all of you uh, here. Even before you sit down, you might as well keep standing because it is our practice to put all witnesses under oath. So if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, for those of you who have given us a prepared statement in advance, that statement will be in the record in its entirety. What we'd like to ask each of you is to uh, give us an oral presentation uh, of uh, around five minutes. Uh, we're going to have a, a clock that will indicate that green for four minutes yellow for the last minute, and then when the five minutes is up, it will turn red. And when you see a red light, we would very much appreciate it if you would uh, uh, conclude your testimony. We're delighted that you're all here, and I thank you for being here. Mr. Williams, why don't we start with you? 
There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pressed and pull it close enough to you so that uh, your testimony can be picked up by the uh, court reporter. Well, thank you, Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and distinguished members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. I appreciate the opportunity to appear, appear before you and discuss your concerns about the Defense Contract Management Agency's contract management and oversight in Iraq. With me today is Captain Dave Graff in the back uh, from our Director of our International Division. First, I would like to recognize the families of our fallen patriots for their courage and strength. We honor their children, spouses, and siblings for the great sacrifices they have made in support of their country and each of us. The loss of life, life is always tragic. Please know that the entire DCMA team is committed to the care and safety of our warfighters, civilians, and contractor personnel. I became the director of DCMA in May of this year, and my comments today reflect my observations over the last three months. I'm extremely proud to lead the DCMA team of approximately 9,900 professional civilians and military located in over 700 locations around the world. DCMA is responsible for the administration of about 324,000 contracts with unliquidated obligations of over $180 billion awarded to over 17,000 contractors. DCMA accepts approximately 750,000 shipments of supplies and some 1,200 aircraft each year. We also manage over $100 billion of government property and administer about $32 billion of contract financial payments each year. I am greatly impressed with the dedication and commitment of our employees to support of our warfighters, and I am honored to serve as the DCMA director. Since the stand-up of the Defense Contract Management Command in March of 1990, except for aircraft maintenance, closeout, and vehicle heavy repair, the agency's contract administration services have been primarily focused on weapon systems. We have, however, applied our support to battlefield service contracts awarded by the military services, largely under the Army's Logistics Civil Augmentation Program, LAWCAP, and to a lesser extent, the Air Force's Contract Augmentation Program, AFCAP. DCMA does not develop or retain employees with deep technical skills in overseeing construction and facilities contracts. To perform contract management responsibilities for service contracts in Iraq, DCMA relies on obtaining technical expertise from the military services in the form of contracting officer representatives or support provided by other Department of Defense entities. Since the initiation of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, DCMA has taken on an increasing role in providing contract management services in support of operations in the theater. In late 2007 and early 2008, DCMA deployed an additional 100 personnel to support the expanded need for additional contractor oversight of personnel security contracts and various other theater-wide contract activities. We anticipate that the total DCMA managed capability in theater will be approximately 225 personnel by the end of this year. Today, DCMA manages contracts in excess of $12 billion supporting 124 forward operating bases and approximately 355,000 coalition forces and civilian contractor personnel in Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, and Afghanistan. DCMA is currently working with the Army on the transition planning for LawCap 4, ensuring that there is no disruption in logistical support to our forces or loss of accountability for the government property that we oversee. Additionally, DCMA has been working very closely with the Joint Contracting Command Iraq Afghanistan to, better, to develop better controls of contractor movement in theater via the use of synchronized pre-deployment and operational tracker system and on various other contract management needs. From a comprehensive agency perspective, I think it is important to recognize that just as our contingency contracting theater mission has grown, our traditional CONUS mission has also grown and become more complex. In fiscal year 2001, we managed contracts with $100 billion of unliquidated obligations, and today that number is $180 billion. Balancing these two missions has further stressed the already downsized DCMA workforce and represents risk on both missions. Since fiscal year 1990, DCMA's civilian workforce has declined by 59 percent to under 10,000 personnel. To address our resource requirements, the agency is working closely with the Office of the Secretary of Defense to ensure we have the required resources to support the needs of the Department. I would like to also thank the Congress for passage last year of the Defense Acquisition Workforce Development Fund, commonly known as Section 852. That fund should certainly help get us started down the road. Let me close by uh, stating that my assessment during the past two and a half months is that we are moving in the right direction collectively in the Department and in DCMA. We have learned from the early days of log cap and we continue to learn every day. This allows us to identify gaps in our administration oversight and continuously revise the processes needed to effectively manage the O&M contract requirements. 
In closing, we appreciate the congressional support of our efforts as the Department's primary contract management agency in providing our nation's warfighters and allies with quality products and services. Again, thank you for the opportunity before, to appear before this committee today to address DCMA's role in this matter. I look forward to answering any questions the committee may have. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Mr. Ernst. Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and distinguished members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss your concerns about contract management and oversight in Iraq. Before I begin, I would like to recognize the men and women who serve our country, and especially the families of our fallen heroes for their courage and heart. Our service men and women and their civilian counterparts lay their lives on the line every day, and the death of any soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or civilian is a tragedy. It was my privilege for close to 25 years to work in helping to ensure that the military men and women who serve this country are provided with the best equipment and services possible. From January 2006 until my retirement at the end of April this year, I had the opportunity to serve as both the acting director and then director of DCMA. Every member of the Defense Contract Management Agency team that I had personal contact with during my career take their responsibility to support the warfighter very seriously. Those men and women that perform this mission in theater in support of our deployed members are some of the most motivated people I've ever worked with. Def Defense Contract Management Agency's mission is worldwide and complex. DCMA excels at the oversight and management of contracts performed in plant environments ac across the globe for a full range of products serviced by the military. To be successful in this mission requires that DCMA's personnel be proficient not only in the business and financial management aspects of the contract, but to also have a detailed understanding of the technical requirements of the product or service being acquired. This technical understanding for in-plant work is gained through professional classroom training, extensive on-the-job training, and experience. This training and experience package allows the quality assurance rep to ensure conformance to technical requirements. One of the main hurdles to accomplishing the oversight mission in Iraq and Afghanistan is that DCMA does not perform the technical function this mission requires outside of theater. As a result, DCMA does not have a core of personnel with extensive knowledge in the areas of potable water, waste treatment, dining facilities, security contracts, or facility construction and maintenance. The Gansler Commission clearly recognized this issue when they recommended that DCMA be provided additional resources and be assigned this mission in the continental U.S. The Commission realized this was necessary in order to gain both the training and experience required to excel in the performance of this mission. Clearly, either DCMA needs to be assigned this mission CONUS with appropriate resource increases or those organizations responsible for this mission outside of theater needs to accept the responsibility for the performance of this mission in theater. From 2001 to 2008, DCMA's personnel decreased by close to 25 percent, while its mission as measured by unliquidated obligations increased by nearly 80 percent. Due to the agency's decreasing number of personnel, increasing requirements both in plant and in theater, and a lack of experience in the technical areas required by theater mission, DCMA implemented an oversight process in Iraq and Afghanistan utilizing an extensive network of contracting officers' representatives. These individuals are typically members of the operational units receiving the services of the contractor and are the technical experts that DCMA relies on to help ensure conformance to contractual technical requirements. The input of these individuals is critical in identifying technical performance issues and providing timely feedback to the DCMA quality assurance representative for appropriate action with the contractor. At the end of April 2008, DCMA had over 600 of these CORs providing technical oversight of the mission and reporting the results to the QAR responsible for overseeing the contractor. In closing, I appreciate the support of both the Department and the Congress of DCMA's effort as the primary contract management agency in providing our nation's warfighters and allies with quality products and services. The in-theater contract oversight mission is a formidable one. Aspects of such a mission, including personnel security and safety, workload shifts and dispersion, and, and personnel placement are a continual challenge. During my time as director of DCMA, I worked to effectively balance resource requirements between our core in-plant mission and our contingency contracting mission to ensure that the high-risk missions in both environments receive the type of coverage required. 
Again, thank you for the opportunity to, to appear before this committee today to address DCMA's role in this matter and answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Ernest. Mr. Parsons. Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and distinguished members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and discuss your concerns related to injuries and deaths associated with electrical issues in Iraq and the Department's management and oversight of these contractors performing operation and maintenance, commonly referred to as O&M, of the facilities where our military and civilian personnel work and live each and every day. Just as the Committee is concerned with the injuries and deaths that have taken place in Iraq, so is the Army. Each injury and loss of life is a tragedy, and we must do all we can to minimize the threats of our personnel. Our management and oversight of contractor performance must ensure that our contractors are meeting the standards and requirements specified in their contracts. To this end, the Army continues to pursue and implement many of the recommendations identified by the Commission on Army Acquisition and Program Management and Expeditionary Operations, which released its final report, Urgent Reform Required Army Expeditionary Contracting, on October 31, 2007. While I am here today as the Army witness, I do work for the U.S. Army Material Command. Our responsibility in the CENTCOM theater of operations primarily consists of management and execution of a logistic civil augmentation program known as LOGCAP. This program is managed by the Army Sustainment Command located at Rock Island Arsenal, Illinois, the subordinate command of the Army Material Command. Based upon our review of available information, it appears that there are a total of 16 deaths resulting from electrocutions or other electrical related incidents since the inception of our operations in Iraq. The majority of these deaths are the result of accidents associated with the conduct of military or construction operations, although three and possibly a fourth appear to be related to electrical issues associated with facilities over a five-year time frame. The only fatality that we can connect to a facility maintained under the Log Cap 3 contract is the tragic January 2, 2008 incident where Staff Sergeant Masses was electrocuted while taking a shower. In those quarters that he lived in were commonly referred to as the RPC. Um, this is a pre-existing Iraqi facility a copy, a cop occupied by U.S. personnel. The circumstances surrounding his death are currently under investigation by the Department of Defense Inspector General. I can ensure the committee that the Army is cooperating with the Inspector General and will, take, will quickly respond to the Inspector General's final report. In addition to corrective actions already taken, we will take whatever additional corrective actions are required to protect the life, safety, and health of our personnel. At the time of Staff Sergeant Mass's death in January 2008, the log cap contract included O&M requirements for the facility where the accident occurred. The task force order covering the O&M of the facilities in the RPC was issued in February 2007. The specific O&M requirements were jointly developed with the customer for the facility in question and commonly referred to as Level B. This means the contractor, in this case Kellogg Brown and Root, was only required to provide limited maintenance. Limited maintenance does not include routine inspections, preventative maintenance, and upgrades. Any repairs that need to be conducted on the facility are initiated with a service request by the customer. We are also aware that there were previous contracts for the O&M of this facility prior to the task order issued under Log Cap 3. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers awarded three previous contracts starting in November 2003 that required the O&M of these facilities. Knowing that there were additional contractors, contracts requiring O&M of facilities in Iraq, we are in the process of identifying the scope of their contractual requirements. This review should provide us with a holistic picture. The electrical issues in Iraq involve more than just the Log Cap 3 contract. As a result of our investigations, we have taken a number of corrective actions. We are working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to obtain additional expertise in the oversight of electrical work by our contractors. Furthermore, we are working with the Corps of Engineers, DCMA, and the customer to develop a plan to conduct inspection verifications of those bu buildings recently inspected by KBR for life, health, and safety issues. We will utilize a third party to validate those inspections. LogCap Program Director also met with KBR officials to discuss their hiring practices and requirements for electricians to include certification requirements. Following this meeting, the contracting officer issued a contract modification to the LogCap 3 contract on July 21, 2008 to more clearly specify personnel and certification requirements. KBR was also directed to submit a trade certificate and validation plan to the government describing the process they will use to recruit, train, and retain qualified personnel. The plan must address the criteria through which personnel, including non-U.S. citizens, will be qualified and are certified as a master journeyman or apprentice. 
and the proposed schedule for implementing the plan. This requirement is also applicable to all subcontractors. Expeditionary military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan have placed extraordinary demands on our contracting system and the people who make it work. The vast majority of our military and civilian contracting personnel perform well in tough, austere conditions. We know that the sex of our warfighters and those who lead them is linked directly to the success of our contracting workforce. We are working hard to ensure that contracting is a core competency with the Army. We appreciate the concerns expressed by the committee and we are aggressively moving, moving out to make improvements. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Parsons. Mr. Hiddell. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. My name is Gordon Hiddell and I am the Acting Inspector General for the Department of Defense. The magnitude and complexity of the Department of Defense requires nothing less than a full-time effort. We are in a time of war and our work not only saves taxpayer dollars, but also, and much more importantly, the lives of U.S. service members. To that end, I assure you that we take issues regarding safety very seriously. The men and women engaged in Operation Iraqi Freedom, whether service members, federal employees, or contractor personnel, deserve an environment that is free from preventable dangers. In response to recent concerns regarding electrocution deaths of service members in Iraq, my office has initiated two complementary reviews. The first review, which is still ongoing, is looking into the relevant management, contracting, and maintenance actions prior to and subsequent to the death of Staff Sergeant Ryan D. Mesas, U.S. Army. This review is being conducted at the request of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisitions and Technology in response to inquiries made by Representative Altmar and observations were provided earlier this week. I want to emphasize and strongly caution that the information I provide here this morning is preliminary in nature and subject to change. This is an interim response, a status report, if you will, not a final report. Just last night, we received significant information from this committee. This was not unexpected as we work to obtain additional information and documentation from various sources leading to our ultimate findings and conclusions, which will be contained in our final report. The second review evaluated the sufficiency of criminal investigations involving electrocution deaths of U.S. military or Department of Defense related personnel in Iraq. This review also sought to glean from the investigative case files information concerning the nature of the electrocutions that might be helpful in responding to the Deputy Undersecretary and to members of Congress. Since March 2003, there were 16 electrocution fatalities in Iraq. Fifteen of those were military members and one Defense Department foreign national civilian employee. We determined that investigations conducted by the U.S. Army Criminal Investigations Command and the Naval Criminal Investigative Service accurately determined the nature and cause of death in each instance. We also found that these 16 electrocutions can be attributed to a variety of causes. This includes electrocution deaths caused by contact with power lines, ungrounded and or faulty electrical equipment and working with electrical equipment or attempting to make an electrical repair. Based on the in investigations reviewed, we are concerned that Iraq's electrical infrastructure continues to pose a significant hazard to U.S. personnel in country. This is due to poor design, inferior construction standards, a failure to upgrade electrical systems and systems that are not properly grounded. Let me once again assure you, my office takes the safety of our men and women serving in Iraq and elsewhere very seriously. We have additional work to perform and will keep you aware of the progress of our efforts regarding the death of Sergeant Mesas. We extend our sympathies to the family of Sergeant Mesas and to his friends and to other individuals and families of others that have been involved in these very, very unfortunate and tragic incidents. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and I am ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hedell. Mr. Horseman. 
I have no opening statement, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Thomas Bruni. I am the Theater Engineering Construction Manager for KBR in Baghdad in support of U.S. and coalition troops. I am here today to assist the committee in its inquiry regarding the maintenance of electrical systems in facilities occupied by U.S. military and contractor personnel in Iraq. I would like to begin my remarks by expressing on behalf of KBR our deepest sympathy to all of the families and friends who have lost loved ones. It is important to honor these soldiers by examining the circumstances surrounding their untimely deaths, and KBR is completely committed to assisting this process. From everything we presently know, KBR's actions were not the cause of any of these terrible accidents. However, I hope that my testimony today will help the committee answer its questions about this important issue. I am a civil engineer and a former member of the United States Marine Corps and the Army National Guard. I have also served as the Director of Engineering for Northeastern University and as the Director of Capital Projects Management for Boston College. I first joined KBR in 2005 as a Deputy Project Manager for in Al Anbar Province. I am now the Theater Engineering and Construction Manager. KBR is one of many contractors providing support to U.S. and coalition personnel in Iraq. The current environment in Iraq presents unique maintenance challenges. Many U.S. military personnel and contractors currently occupy facilities that were built during Saddam Hussein's reign and contain inferior electrical and other systems compared to U.S. standards. KBR is therefore even more acutely aware of electrical safety concerns. A number of electrical shock incidents have recently gained attention in the media and in Congress. There are media reports that as many as 15 soldiers have been killed by electrical shocks in Iraq. These reports have contained a number of factual errors and inaccuracies. The reality is that KBR's actions were not the cause of any of these terrible accidents. In fact, only one of the 15 incidents even occurred at a facility where KBR had maintenance responsibility. And I'd like to describe KBR's current understanding of that incident. KBR had as directed maintenance responsibilities at the Radwania Palace Complex, or RPC where a soldier died from an electrical shock in January 2008. RPC, which consists of roughly 200 buildings, was built and controlled by Saddam Hussein's regime until occupied by the U.S. military. The military had assigned Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth to live in a small one-level building at RPC, now known as LSF-1, with another Army Staff Sergeant and an Iraqi interpreter. At the time that KBR for, was first tasked with any maintenance for this building in 2006, all of the electrical systems and equipment had already been installed, though KBR does not know when or by whom. KBR's maintenance responsibility at that time was limited to repairs only at the direction of the Army. It is important to understand how the Army categorizes maintenance responsibilities. Under log cap, the Army directs KBR to perform different levels of maintenance service. In some facilities, KBR provides level A maintenance service in which KBR is authorized to perform maintenance and repairs without specific instructions from the Army. In other facilities, KBR provides level B maintenance service, performing repairs only when specifically directed to do so by the Army. The decision to classify any building at a specific level is a decision made by the Army at its own discretion. In February 2007, KBR conducted a technical inspection of LSF-1. Under law cap, KBR conducts such inspections to assess the conditions of a building, and the Army determines the level of service required for that building. For LSF-1, the Army directed KBR to provide level B service. Therefore, KBR was not authorized to perform repairs without specific direction from the Army. This February 2007, technical inspection identified a number of electrical deficiencies. However, the Army did not authorize KBR to repair the identified electrical deficiencies. In November 2007, at the Army's request, KBR again produced the same February 2007 technical inspection. Once again, the Army did not authorize KBR to make the repairs. 
It is my understanding that the Army now believes that Staff Sergeant Maseff's death was the result of a malfunctioning water pump on the roof of his building. Though we cannot be certain who installed the water pump, we do know that KBR did not do so and that it was most likely Iraqi installed. We have been told that the water pump contained camel hair string in place of Teflon tape, which is a practice frequently used by local Iraqi workers. Finally, at the direction of the Army, KBR has subsequently performed additional inspections in the LSF-1 building as well as other buildings throughout RPC. KBR has also conducted at the Army's direction inspections of all occupied hard stand structures in Iraq. As I have described, KBR views safety as a top priority and will continue to pursue the highest level of safety throughout Iraq. I hope that my testimony has aided the committee in understanding these issues, and I will do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bruni. We will now have uh, questions from members of the committee. I will start off. I want to ask about the uh, death of Staff Sergeant uh, Ryan Maseth. He was a highly decorated Army Ranger, a former Green Beret, killed in January of this year while taking a shower. Army investigators determined that he was electrocuted. Both the Defense Department and KBR have said they had no knowledge of any electrical problems that resulted in his death, that they didn't know of any in that building. Mr. Hedell, uh, you are the Acting Defense Department Inspector General and your office issued an interim memo on Monday stating that you had no credible evidence that either KBR or Defense Contract Management Agency knew of these problems. And I would like to ask you about some documents the committee obtained that you did not uh, or may not have. First, the committee obtained a work order. Uh, this is a work order from July 8, 2007, that was submitted by Sergeant First Class Justin Hummer. Sergeant Hummer lived in the exact uh, room before Staff Sergeant Maseth moved into it, and Sergeant Maseth replaced Sergeant Hummer in October 2007, so they both used the exact same shower. This work order seems to indicate that Sergeant Hummer warned of exactly the electrical problem that killed Sergeant Maseth, and I think we furnish you with a copy of it. It says LSF, that's the building they lived in. Pipes have voltage, get shocked in shower. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see it says Kellogg Brown Root, uh, proprietary data. Mr. Hedell, on its face, this document seems to be credible evidence that KBR was aware of this hazard last July. Do you agree? Uh, I do agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Were you aware of this document before you issued your interim uh, memo on Monday? Um, no, sir, I was not. If I could, Mr. Chairman, um, just want to make a correction for the record. Well, uh, let me ask you about some of the, the questions that I have, and yes, then we will give you an opportunity to do that. I want to show you another document. This is a spreadsheet of task orders uh, at, that the Defense Department provided to the committee, and this spreadsheet lists the same work order from July 8, 2007, warning that Sergeant Hummer get shocked in the shower. Mr. Hedell, this document seems to be credible evidence that the Defense Department was aware of this problem as well. Do you agree? It would appear so, sir. And finally, Mr. Hedell, let me show you a sworn statement signed by Sergeant Hummer on June 6, 2008. In this statement, Sergeant Hummer says this wasn't the only work order he submitted. He says he was shocked four or five times in the shower before uh, uh, June two th between June 2000 two se uh, 2007, when he first moved into the building, and October 2007, when he moved out and Staff Sergeant Maseth replaced him. Mr. Heldell, uh, you know your memo was not a final product, the memo you issued yesterday. You said it was interim. It was a snapshot of what you learned to date. But someone leaked the document last night. And the press reported you absolved KBR and the Defense Department of any knowledge of this problem or any responsibility for fixing it. Given these new documents, do you stand by the statement in your memo or would you like to go back and review them in light of this new information? Well, there is nothing really to change, Mr. Chairman. My, my position has never been to absolve anyone of responsibility or culpability. What we provided to your office 
on Monday of this week, sir, and to this committee, and also to the, De to the Secretary of Defense, uh, was a status, a, a, meaning our preliminary observations of what we have found up to that point. Well, it was I'm not a report, and it was simply a status. A final report will be forthcoming. Well, I'm concerned, uh, I'm concerned, Mr. Hedell, because it seems like you have less information than the committee. It raises the question of whether you were doing your job or whether the Defense Department or KBR officials were withholding information from you. And as our investigation continues, we're going to need answers to these questions. And I presume you're going to need to answer these questions as well. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I can't presume to tell you whether information was withheld. I can only tell you what we knew up until Monday when we, re when we provided the committee with an idea of what we were going to be testifying to today. I will tell you, you don't have to be an Inspector General to be very concerned about these tragic deaths. And you don't have to be an Inspector, inspector General to expect candor and forthcoming from entities who might have knowledge or information regarding this. I'm not saying that anyone withheld, but what I am saying at this point is these documents that you brought to my attention this morning, I was not, I had not seen these, was not aware of them until this committee brought them to our attention last night, I believe it was. They're certainly, they're certainly very dramatic and they certainly um, um, are documents that we will have to spend a lot of time looking at. We anticipate as we have even before this committee was um, announced for this hearing, that we would find a lot of additional information, Mr. Chairman, and we, we think that we will. Well, I appreciate that. And these due documents do undermine the tentative conclusion you submitted to us earlier well, uh, this week. We have absolved no one. Let, let that record be clear on that. Never have and have not at, at this moment. Thank you very much. Mr. Isa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hedell, I'd, I'd like to continue. Uh, you know, we're the, we're the Committee on Oversight and Reform, and I always try to remember that we look at the reform part of this. When we look at this contract, or any contract, that essentially says take somebody else's work and maintain it, we, and that work is not essentially up to U.S. standards or even comfortable at U.S. standards in voltage, in plugs, and so on, are we inherently producing a contract that puts us, and I'll ask Mr. Uh, Bruni too, aren't we, and I'm leading a little bit, but aren't we inherently, if we limit a contract to that and, and we don't have a separate oversight who does a clean bill of health on the structure and the equipment, aren't we inherently handing something off that has a gap in its safety and, uh, and reliability? Well, um, with all due respect, Congressman, I'm, I, I understand what you're saying, and in principle, I agree with that. But when you look at the system, um, for instance, that was the, the contract that was in play in this particular instance, and the process that was set up, the the relationship process, let's say, between the contractor KBR and the the contract administrator DCMA, um, there are hoops that have to be jumped through that have to be looked at and acknowledged, and the customer, as Mr. Parsons referred to it, being the, the Army in this case, they have to, they have to bring items to the attention uh, of, of appropriate people, and, and then things begin to happen, changes are made, and therefore, I think every, everyone that, that is in Iraq, soldier, contractor, civilian, uh, deserves the, the uh, feeling that they are being protected okay, from these well, things. Okay. Well, Mr. Parsons, maybe I'll go, go to you next, because somebody died who, based on the contracts this committee has, should not have died because there were warnings, based on this document, that should have caused a look for why are there shocks to somebody in a shower. When you're dealing with high voltage, there's no question that, that that's not a small what if. So when we look at the contract, uh, and the command structure, because of course these people worked for commissioned officers, NCOs and commissioned officers. Where was the gap that allowed this to happen in your opinion? Granted, I'm asking you to Monday morning quarterback, but w this committee needs to make sure that procurement going forward doesn't have these loopholes in it. 
So, sir, it goes all, I would say from my personal opinion that it goes back to uh, what is the requirement. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, through the requirements determination process, it's clear that the customer, uh, if this, in this case it would have been multinational core Iraq and the mayor, the local mayor that's responsible for that uh, RPC complex, had done some prioritization on what buildings were going to get what level of maintenance. And, uh, you know, in this case they elected to level B. Uh, which uh, does not require routine inspections and preventative maintenance. I can't tell you why that decision was, uh, was made. Okay, well, um, let, let's go back through the command structure for a moment. Uh, uh, the chairman is, is, is taking one line, but I'm not going to take a different line in this case because people died who shouldn't have died, a person died who shouldn't have died. I'm a former Army officer. Somebody had to look out for the well being of every soldier, every soldier's weapon every soldier's equipment. Who was that somebody and what did that person do to ensure that that living condition was safe? Uh, sir, in my opinion, the mayor of that RPC complex is ultimately the one that has to make the calls on, uh, on those types of things or what repairs are going to be affected and executed. And I can't tell you, I think the DOD IG has taken a look at that entire process. Uh, I think you're right, there probably are some gaps that need to be, uh, be examined. Okay. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed, but uh, let me go back to Mr. Hedell for just a second. Can you come back to this committee, because I don't believe you're prepared to answer today, and tell us within the command structure that says no uniformed soldier shall ever not have a chain of command that includes uniformed superiors, can you tell us today or by written backup who that, who that was, who was responsible? And with all due respect, Mr. Parsons, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here not to blame KBR because it appears as though their contract was fairly limited and it doesn't appear as though they were tasked properly. Mr. Hedell, I need to know what soldier was responsible for that soldier and if it was a mayor, and I assume this is an Iraqi mayor, then I, with, it was a U.S. mayor? Yeah, let, me, let me correct. The, the, uh, the, uh, the military units appoint May, their mayors. It's a, a term that's used for their. Okay. It's equivalent to default. It was a commissioned works. officer. My I'm not sure. I can't answer whether it was okay, a commissioned well, officer. Okay. For the record, because I'm out of time and I want to be respectful of the, of the committee's time, I would like to know the chain of command because, as a former Army officer, and, and I appreciate the chairman's indulgence for just a second, we need to know that the chain of command met its responsibility for the health and safety of its personnel, and that includes obviously the procurement irregularities that may or may not have occurred, but we have to understand who was responsible for that person's welfare. Today that's not really what we're talking about. I don't want to look at an electrician who did or didn't get a task order. I want to look at the chain of command and did it do its job. And if there are changes that we need to make or the House Armed Services Committee needs to make, we need to provide that guidance. So I, I hope you'll respond for the record and I, I hope other members will, will perhaps pick up if you have answers. I, Thank the chairman for his indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bruni, I'd like to ask you about Staff Sergeant Maces, and uh, who was electrocuted on January 2nd, 2008. In your written testimony today, you state that KBR wasn't allowed under contract to make repairs to Staff Sergeant Maces' building without specific direction from the Army. You also say that the Army did not authorize KBR to make these repairs. And then you address the water pump that electrocuted Staff Sergeant Maseth. You said, though we cannot be certain who installed the water pump, we do know the KBR did not do so. Uh, that is your testimony, correct? Yes, sir, it is. The committee has obtained documents that seem to suggest the KBR may have installed the faulty water pump. Let me go through these documents and ask you about them. First, uh, we have already talked about the work order submitted by Sergeant Justin Hummer, who lived in the same quarters before Staff Sergeant Maseth moved in. Let's, let's put that, that's, that's up there, okay. If you recall, this work order warned that the pipes have voltage and that he was getting shocked in the shower. This was the same shower that Staff Sergeant Maseth was subsequently electrocuted. Have you ever seen this work order, order before? Uh, yes, sir, I have. Okay. Let me show you another work order. Let me show you another work order. This one is from the next morning on July 9th, 2007. 
You can see that it's the same building. It's the same person, Justin Hummer, signed it at the bottom. And when you look at the task box, it says, quote, replace pressure switch and water pump. And when you look at the labor box, it says three by three, meaning three people work for three hours. And you can see the total of nine hours. Then when you look at the material box, there are various items. And over on the right, you can see one says one water pump. This work order is stamped finished at the top. Does this mean the KBR installed the water pump that malfunctioned that caused Staff Sergeant Maseth's death? No, sir, it does not. We believe that this particular installation occurred not at LSF-1, but at another building. There is another document that says that the pump and switch were located on the eastern side of the building. The pump unit for LSF-1 is on the roof. We believe that this work was accomplished in another building. Sergeant Hummer placed a service order request for more buildings than just LSF-1. I still, why would Sergeant Hummer request a replacement of the water pump for other buildings other than the one he was Because visiting. he wrote work orders, Mr. Congressman, for other buildings, yeah. not just LSF-1. I see. Well, this work order says time started was July 9th, 2007, 0800 hours, and it says time completed was the same day at 1100 hours. Uh, does that indicate that they actually did the work on the day of those three hours? Yes, sir. It would appear that it was accomplished on that day. This is Hummer. His yeah. This is uh, Sergeant Hummer's declaration uh, stating that during the months that I was living at LSF uh, Advisory Building, I was shocked four or five times in the shower, the same shower where Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth was electrocuted. That's Sergeant, Sergeant First Class Justin Hummer. Mr. Chairman, KBR's spokeswoman, Heather Brown, has stated publicly that there is no evidence to, of a link between KBR's work and these electrocutions. Her statements appeared in various press accounts on July 18th. To me, this document raises serious questions about KBR's work, and it appears to contradict not only Mr. Bruni's testimony, but the public statements KBR officials have made for weeks on this issue. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Higgins. Mr. Davis. Um, thank you very much. Let me uh, start with the Army. Um, Mr. Parsons, um, an initial estimate, cost estimate was requested in order to refurbish the palace complex, as I understand it, where the tragedy occurred, the, where the Maseth tragedy occurred. And it would have brought the facilities up to log cap standards, which was $10 million. A second estimate was done for level B maintenance, uh, but under level B facilities were taken in, it would reduce the price to $3 million. Is that right? Sir, I have heard about the first estimate before. I have not seen anything to verify that that estimate was actually produced. Um, okay, but they went with level B, is that right? It was uh, for the entire RPC area, for the, for the maintenance of the yeah. RPC area? Yes. They went with the lower, with a level B instead of uh, a whole refurbishing. Is that fair to say, log cap standards? The, so I'm not sure if I follow you, but the, uh, the actual uh, estimate, uh, again, was uh, negotiated between the, uh, the, the log cap program office and the uh, contractor, including the customer, to determine what uh, level maintenance was going to be required. And so the uh, customer in this case, uh, was, was um, KBR involved in that? Would they have been negotiating that? The, 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 the KBR was involved from the standpoint that they were preparing the uh, price estimate in response to what the requirement was. Uh, Did the requirement, would the requirement have included making this basically shockproof, the showers there? Not for this particular facility, because this particular facility was designated, as I said before, as a level B. 
which did not require any upgrades now, or, or uh, repairs. Right. Now, but there had been previous reports of people being shocked there, hadn't there? Uh, based on previously, uh, before the log cap contract, yeah. yeah, we were under the impression that there were some electrical issues identified. So with why would you go with the level B? I, sir, I can't answer that question. Who would have made that decision? It would have been, again, the mayor, mayor cell, cell, which, again, is not an Iraqi mayor. It's the uh, unit that occupied that RPC complex. And what unit is that and who's the person? Do you know? It, what? Who is that? I'm not sure who that is, sir. It would have been someone from the Moldy National. Colonel, Corps. we don't know his name in the command structure. Do right? not. Can you get that to us and get that to the yes, committee? Yes, we'll take that for the record. Um, is risk mitigation a factor when you decide how much to spend and what level of maintenance to provide? Sir, I think the risk mitigation is always a factor when they decide uh, what uh, what the requirement is going to be. And I can only assume in this case that there was some uh, of that going on when they determined what level of maintenance was going to be required for the different facilities. Are the operational commanders who are using the services of, of contractors fully informed about the levels of risk they're taking on by opting for less than full level A maintenance? Uh, sir, I can't answer that question. I don't know how far down that uh, information flows. Um, so I would say that the, uh, the mayor uh, who is responsible for that RPC certainly knows uh, the risk associated with a different level of maintenance. How that is flowed down from there, I cannot tell you. Let me ask uh, Mr. Bruni, um, who is to blame for this? Is KBR to blame? Sir, I do not believe so, no, sir. All right. Is the Army to blame? Sir, I don't know if it is that simple, a uh, black and white case. Um, well, if it's not the Army and it's not KBR, then who could it be? Sir, all I can tell you is that uh, from the KBR perspective, we, didn't, we don't understand what tactical or force protection issues may have been uh, required to be factored into the Army's decision in, in this decision-making well, process. Well, whatever decision we, we was made, know. whatever decision was made, you would agree that someone shouldn't turn in the shower and get electrocuted, wouldn't you? I would agree that that is not something that should happen, yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, particularly if there were previous reports of people being shocked in the shower. It is not like this was without warning. Yes, sir. So under that scenario, if KBR, as you maintain, is not to be blamed, who else could, could you possibly blame for this? Wouldn't it be the Army? I am not trying to well, focus on any individual in the Army or what that, that is all. We don't even know the Colonel's name who was making these decisions. But wouldn't yes, it be, be fair under that to say that the Army would, would be responsible? Sir, even if the Army had. Uh, I am just asking you a question. Wouldn't it seem be, wouldn't the Army be responsible? Or do you think the soldier should be responsible for no, going on taking it, a shower? No, sir. It shouldn't be the soldier. Okay. Should it be the Army? I think that the Army could have turned. Uh, the situation differently. Well, sure they could have. In retrospect, they should have. So aren't they responsible? I know they're a client and you're looking for more contracts, but let's just, you, you know, you're saying you're not responsible. I can understand that. I mean, you know, it, wouldn't the Army then be responsible for this in one way, shape, or form? I think that the Army has some responsibility in this. Well, if they have some, who would have the rest of them? Just conceivably, who else could have it if the Army just has some responsibility? Would responsibility, KBR have some then? Would KBR have some? The responsibility lies with the Army. That's all I'm asking. I'm just, just, just trying to, to figure it out. Nobody, but he's dodging. This is a tragic case. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Parsons, of the 16 electrocutions, how many occurred on KBR managed facilities? Sir, our understanding, and based on the records we've looked at, only one uh, okay. was connected to a uh, KBR maintained facility. That was the Mason. Uh, Mr. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ms. McCollum, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Parsons, you make a comment in your written testimony on page six that I find absolutely remarkable. You say that neither Log Camp or uh, DCMA have sufficient skill set or expertise to perform adequate oversight of electrical work being performed by uh, uh, KRB. Then you say you are trying to acquire the expertise. My question to you is, who has been overseeing KRB's electrical work for the past five years? Ma'am, uh, as uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ernst uh, testified earlier in his opening statement, uh, 
Uh, for those con log cap contracts, DCMA has been providing quality assurance oversight, which uh, really focuses on the contractor's processes. They, uh, they focus on whether the contractor has got the right QA processes in place. I'm hearing, they aren't doing I'm actual hearing processes. I want to know who was going in and, and looking and inspecting KRB's electrical work for the past five years. Who uh, went? They, again, for the technical inspections, they rely on what we can uh, call contracting officer representatives, which are appointed in each of the units. Those are the individuals that have the subject matter expertise to provide that type of level of oversight. Well, but, but Mr. Parsons, I'm going to move on, but you've already said that there was no one available with that type of expertise. The DM, uh, the, the DCMA and the Army have responsibility for of the ultimate responsibility is what you're saying through all these subcontracting and whatever that they did to oversee KRB's work. Your statement, uh, you know, uh, that you don't have the expertise to over over uh, see the job adequately, it basically said that no one in our government was taking on the responsibility of making sure that the safety of our troops was being looked at and, and handled uh, quickly. And, and in my opinion, that's just strictly deplorable. And it's, uh, it's astounding how dependent our military has become on private companies that they just don't have the, the can do, I can do it myself, um, as, as past military had had where they could call on people directly to take care of things. Now in Staff Sergeant um, uh, Mathis building, there were work orders to fix the electrical problems for a shower. And uh, here's this sworn statement on June 6, 2008 by the individual who lived in the building who used the shower before the staff sergeant um, Macy. His name is Sergeant Justin Hummer and he stated, during the months I was living in the LSF building, I was shocked four or five times in the shower, the same shower where Staff Sergeant Macy was electrocuted. He said on an occasion he had to use a wooden spoon. I don't know, but you know, you're bringing wooden spoons to the shower, kind of telling something that uh, our service men knew that there was a big problem here uh, because the electrical current was so strong. He stated that in response to each work order, personnel from KRB showed up, but the problems persisted. He said his roommate even submitted a work order for these problems. According to Sergeant Hummer, he made these requests over and over and over. Mr. Parsons, KRB never adequately addressed these problems, did they? And the fact that maybe they had work orders for another unit that was faulty doesn't mean that there aren't work orders that exist that uh, were generated by Sergeant Justin Hummer. Can you uh, work to provide the committee with these work orders? Because obviously we're missing some. Ma'am, ma with this new uh information that we've received, we'll work with the De uh, Department of Defense IG to uh, look and gather more of the work orders. Well, the fact that, that we don't have the work orders for something that was pretty specific um, in what this committee was going to be dealing with, with the death of one of our servicemen, is, is a little astonishing. So obviously, um, we're not going to find work orders stamped fixed after uh, four or five times, Sergeant. Justin Hummer requested the shower be fixed. Um, so my question is, basically, where was the government in all of this? I heard you folks refer, refer to customers. You know, a customer is someone who has a choice of where to go shopping for their cell phone. A customer is not a soldier who's going in to take a shower. That soldier does not have a choice. But we have a responsibility. So did anyone ever go out and check and see if KRB did what it was supposed to do? Your quality assurance officials, where were they? Uh, Congresswoman, I, let, let me try to answer that again, uh, what Mr. Parsons had said. As I stated in my opening statement, we do not have the requisite skills to see facilities and maintenance oversight. We're assigned that mission in theater by the department in order to bring the kind of skills that we lack. We work with the service units themselves to bring the technical experts that have the kind of skills required to oversee it. I don't have the specifics in this instance. We'd have to go back and take a look at the report from the COR, see if there were reports from the COR Mr. on the ground. To Thank the, you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 
I want to thank uh, Chairman Waxman for uh, having um, the, these hearings. And we've had hearings on the U.S. Embassy and all the shoddy work that's going on there as well. We don't want State Department and other uh, people being electrocuted. And um, I'm glad that you're going to uh, produce the work orders that Sergeant Justin uh, Hummer had put in four, five times. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Mr. Bilbray, you recognize the five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield to Mr. Issa for a moment. I thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hostman, are you a military veteran? Yes, sir, I am. What were you in what branch? I was in the Navy for 26 years. Okay. Commissioned officer. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, then that means that I have six people here who are all military veterans, Air Force, Army, Navy. Uh, I'm sorry, I had you listed as Air Force Reserve. No, okay. sir. Okay. Well, then I'll leave you out of this. I put my hat on for a minute while I was waiting for the other the gentlelady's comments to end, which were good. As Lieutenant Darrell Issa or Captain Darrell Issa, I had to ask the question, how dare any of us think that the first mistake wasn't a sergeant reporting a near electrocution four times and the command structure didn't close down that shower including maybe the whole that whole facility until it was clarified. Now, for those who served, ask, please answer just a quick question. Do any of you know a good reason that the immediate chain of command didn't take that action until it was corrected for the safety of that sergeant? Forgetting about the work order, uh, KBR don't answer as, as, as a contractor, as, answer as a former military person. Isn't the first responsibility of the immediate commander who has the authority to say, I can't have that guy in that shower. I got to have him showering down the hall or be in a different barracks. Does any of you disagree with that at all here? No, I don't. Thank you very much. Mr. Bilbray, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me first clarify that the general lady was concerned about the issue of contracting out a lot of these services. Let me say this as somebody who represents one of the largest concentrations of military service individuals um, in the entire world. Um, there are going to be these contracts and they're essential. You can't ask um, and nor do they want to participate in having sworn uh, service members issuing towels at a gym or doing a lot of these, these maintenance work that we've been contracting out since we sent contracts out to build the forts in the West. But that aside, we have over 100,000 um, service personnel in Iraq today. As somebody who comes from being a mayor and a council member and a county chairman, it's not brain surgery to know how to set up a building inspection system where the unified building code is enforced. The most successful government regulation ever comprised in the world is a unified building code. Are we saying, Ms. Parson, we don't have somebody on staff or on contract, and probably contract, that has a background as a building inspector would be required in a city, which has practical, not book learning, doesn't come out of college, but has experience in the field that they're inspecting. Do we have on staff or on contract, preferably contract, former electricians who now function as the building inspector for electrical work? Sir, we are in the process of uh, working with uh, the theater, with the um, multinational core Iraq to do exactly that. Uh, they have brought in some CBs, they have brought in some Air Force uh, red, uh, red Horse teams with those types of engineers. Army Corps of Engineers is also going to be sending some of those types of experts to help do that type of thing you're talking about with the inspections of the buildings to really understand what the safety issues are with them. Well, Mr. Bernie, working in the United States, um, when you go in and put in a pump, put in an electrical system, um, isn't it traditional that before the job is done, you get a sign-off from, from an, a building inspector? Yes, sir. You pull a permit. And, and who does the sign-off when you're in Iraq and you finish putting in an electrical system? What is the, who signs it off? Uh, if there is a QAR available and assigned to that task, he will do that. And that QAR is, the member. background is a is trained he? electrician who has experience in the field that they're inspecting. I can't, I can't vouch to that, no sir, I do not know. Okay, Mr. Brennan, let me just tell you flat out, if you're gonna look for the CBs, if you're gonna look for the engineers, you're gonna look for in-house operations. It doesn't take brain surgery to contract former building inspectors 
and bring them out on short-term contracts to be able to get this job done. We're doing contractors, and that's why I disagree with the gentlelady about this ought to be all in-house. The ability to grab somebody who has experience doing this all over America, has been doing it for 20, 30 years, and be able to spot the fact that a ground was not properly grounded is not brain surgery to these guys who have the experience. I know those of us that haven't worked in this field, it looks, it's, it's magic. But uh, what I'm concerned about is there is not a city in this country at 10, 15,000 that doesn't have the ability to have a building inspector check out electrical system before the switch is allowed to be thrown. Why can't we do the same operation in, an, uh, in a facility or an operation in Iraq that has over 100,000 personnel out there that we need to protect? Sir, I don't think there is anything to uh, prevent us from doing that. That is um, one of the things I believe Major General McHale, who's been uh, tagged by uh, uh, General Petraeus in the multinational corps to get his arms around. He's looking at the different options that he has to bring those type of uh, uh, companies and personnel into theater to do those types of inspections, and we're working closely with Defense Contract Management Agency. Is it a well. policy today that unified building code will apply unless it's wavered? Is that a policy for our... Can you repeat uh, that, sir? Is a unified building code apply to all projects, all construction in, in um, Iraq unless those those codes are waived, or are those not even considered? Sir, my understanding is that there are various codes that are being used. Uh, again, one of the uh, charges to uh, General McHale is to come up with a unified standard that will be used by troops and by all contractors. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time. It's just that you know and I know that the entire United States, almost every municipality and every government agency and every contractor uses a unified building code as the universal consensus. I don't see why we have to reinvent the wheel and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, in fact, we had somebody inspecting those uh, things. In, in 2008, after the death of Staff uh, Sergeant Massif, KBI conducted a complete electrical inspection of all the buildings in the Radwania Palace complex uh, where the sergeant lived. The inspection found that a majority of the electrical systems are in complete disarray, that a majority of the electrical panels are in disrepair and require replacement, and that 45 water pumps needed to be replaced because of electrical shortage uh, or age. These problems were so severe that KBI's own site manager recommended that service members immediately evacuate six buildings. We have a copy of this recommendation from KBI to the Army, and let me read it to you. The electrical conditions in all buildings make them uninhabitable for safety and health reasons. The recommended course of action, if the buildings will continue to be used, is to disconnect the power to the buildings immediately and completely replace the electrical systems. Now, Mr. Bruni, why didn't KBI recommend evacuating the troops from these buildings when they were inspected in 2007? I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Why didn't KBI recommend evacuating the troops from these same buildings when you inspected them in 2007? So when we inspected them in 2007 and produced the technical inspections that identified the deficiencies, uh, we had submitted them directly to, directly to the mayor, and uh, it was then his responsibility to take that and make decisions about what we should be turned on to perform. Well, you, you didn't recommend that people evacuate the building in 2007, did you? No, sir, we did not. Okay. And everybody keeps referring to the mayor. Let me get it clear. The mayor is a military individual, is he not? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Mr. Ernst, in February of 2008, you received a memo from the head of the DCMA in Iraq. The memo said that the problems KBR identified in 2008 were virtually the same, identical, to those that were identified in 2007. Let me read that memo if I could. The overwhelming majority of these findings in the Legion Security Force area were identical to those findings of problems as either alleged or identified in the 10 February 2007 limited inspection. Is that right? Uh, could you clarify which report that was, sir? This was the report that you received in February 2007 relating to the inspections in 2007, the 10 February 2007 limited inspection. What Was that the safety inspection report in 2007? It was a memo that you received from the head of the DCMA. Right, I, I, re I understand, sir. I, re I received that in 2008. But right. uh, the reference to, uh, just uh, for refresher purposes, was that the safety inspection? I believe it was, but we can check if that makes a okay. difference. Do yes, you remember yeah. getting it or you don't? Uh, I don't remember getting the safety inspection, sir, but I do remember getting this one. You remember getting the one that I just read? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Mr. Bruni, in KBR at that time said that these defects were serviceable. This year, you look at the same buildings and the same problems, and you find that they're uninhabitable. 
and they're the same problem. So what's changed in the intervening 12 months? Essentially nothing, sir. The uh, classification as serviceable but uh, requiring with qualifications, the qualifications are that the deficiencies were to be repaired. To further uh, answer your previous question, after those technical inspections were delivered to the, the military at the RPC, there were meetings held between the site management and the mayor to discuss the next steps and onward uh, prog progression of what should be done. Okay. All right. What concerns me here is it looks to be, and maybe you're clarifying that now, it looks to be in 2007, as serious as these were, nobody recommends that the buildings be evacuated. 2008, same problems. All of a sudden, they're being uh, recommended that people evacuate or just don't use the facilities or whatever. All that seems to have happened in the interim is that the staff sergeant died and this committee started investigating. But are you telling me that you had verbal conversations back after the 2007 reports and made a recommendation to evacuate? No, sir. We did not make that recommendation. That's not our recommendation to make in a normal situation. Well, it was your recommendation in, to make in 2008. Why wouldn't to why repair would you the, possibly see something that so serious in 2007? Something that could result in something this, uh, this harmful to somebody and not make a recommendation that they evacuate. Sir, we made the recommendation that the deficiencies that had been identified be fixed, that they be repaired. When it finally got to the point in February that nothing was happening, the uh, general program manager for KBR in Iraq met directly and personally with uh, the commander of DCMA and said something has to be done. And, and I that's guess my why question that is, why did he feel that way in 2007? I mean, it was just as serious then. Sir, I can't answer that question. I, d I don't know why he didn't. All right. Thank you. You'll back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to go back to the level one, level two maintenance distinction, is that the right terminology? Or level A and level B, is that what it is? So level A is a higher degree of responsibility for uh, upgrade and maintenance than level B is. And you said that the, uh, you're not sure how the determination was made as to why this particular location um, was under a level B designation, is that right? Sir, do you mind repeating that question? I had you. You, I think you said that you're not sure who made the decision that this would be a level B designation in terms of the particular location that we've been focusing on today. Sir, from our review of the uh, information that we've uh, seen for the uh, circumstances surrounding that, it was a co it was a team effort between the customer, which in this case is the Moldy National Corps Rec, the actual units that are occupying that RPC. Our log cap program office was involved with those uh, negotiations. DCMA was part of that negotiation as well, and it's a team effort on determining. With the, based on the customer's resources and their prioritization and risk assessments on what those, what those uh, trade-offs are going to be. I can't tell you for sure what the thought processes are for that specific building on why they decided that one was level B and others level A, but those are resource trade-offs associated with risks that the units are making as they occupy those buildings. Mr. Bruni, does, uh, does KBR, I mean, what kind of perspective does KBR bring to the discussion of whether something is going to be designated as a level A or level B uh, maintenance responsibility for you all? Sir, that's basically a decision made by the military, by the mayor, based on his tactical or uh, planning process for the use of that base. Okay, so a KBR maintenance person will come across a situation um, and they might determine that a certain amount of upgrade needs to be performed. And then they will consult with their status of being either in a level A or level B before they, before they decide whether to do that upgrade. In other words, does, does the KBR person sit there and say, my goodness, there's a, we got a bad situation here, um, but this is a level B uh, uh, 
situation or facility and therefore my hands are tied in terms of what I can do. Is that yes, how it works? Yes, sir. Basically, we produce a technical inspection that quantifies those deficiencies. Does and it? in level B maintenance or service uh, status, that technical inspection is, re is turned over to the mayor, the military uh, entity at that camp uh -huh. to make a decision of whether we should be told to make those repairs. And if you're not told to make those repairs, and you come back and you see the situation hasn't changed, you just do another report? N no, sir. There would be uh, most probably, and I, I don't know specifically in this case, but there would be follow-on discussions with the mayor about his process and priorities for moving forward to make these changes, the deficiency remediations. So presumably that happened, but you, you still weren't getting the orders to fix and upgrade this particular situation that we've been yes, focusing sir. on. Does the KBR contract with the government have provisions in it that indemnify you against uh, claims that are brought in situations where you uh, make the government aware of a situation in a level B uh, status and they don't uh, react and take action on a on one ba one basis or on a repeated basis. Do you know? I'm, I'm not aware of that, sir. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh -huh. There's two. I guess the evidence was that there, or the testimony we have is that um, there's been 283 fires at facilities that were that are maintained or were maintained by KBR that are traceable to electrical problems and dysfunction. Is that correct? We've think? just uh, come into uh, possession of that report from DCMA uh -huh. and we're looking at it right now, sir. I mean, I just but find I, it, I find it implausible that, that a contractor of your size and experience uh, wouldn't have pretty specific uh, guidelines in place in terms of uh, uh, who would be liable under these circumstances. I, mean, I guess you're making the case that you, you're arriving in a situation where um, there's already been equipment installed and then you're just supposed to maintain it. But I would think you would get some kind of liability protection. You said you don't know who installed these things. Mr. Chairman, before my time runs out, I'd just like to ask, does anybody know who did the original fitting out of this electrical work? How is it, all right, so how is it possible that nobody knows that? <laughs> I mean, these were, because it was done before we were on the scene, is that the idea? S sir, we, we became aware that there were previous contracts for these uh, facilities that were issued by the Corps of Engineers dating back to 2003. Um, I've asked the Corps of Engineers to research and go through those contracts to understand what the scope of work is. We will share that information with the DODIG. They have an interest in that as well, because I had the same question that you did. All right, what was the original assessment made on these buildings when we first started occupying them? And I can't give you that answer right now, but we will definitely get to the bottom of it, taking a look back at uh, what happened in 2003, 2004, when these buildings were being occupied by our forces. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, the the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I, I appreciate the, the panel coming forward to try to help us make sense of this. Uh, I just, uh, I just had an opportunity over the weekend to, to, to visit Iraq again, uh, specifically with a focus on, on this hearing. I had an opportunity to sit with uh, uh, General Tim McHale, uh, who's conducting the investigation here. And uh, the, the bottom line here is this is a terrible tragedy. Uh, Sixteen fine young Americans put on the uniform for this country, and, uh, and, and they were not protected. Uh, in a very basic way, uh, and we did not provide uh, an environment for them um, within, within their own bases and within their own housing facilities uh, that, that protected them in a, in a meaningful way. 
Now, as sad as that tragedy is, it would be a greater tragedy to point the finger of blame at other individuals who may not deserve it. Uh, but, I, but I do want to, in, in, with, with all due respect, and, and I think it's our duty to those families and also to the 142,000 folks that are still over there, uh, that, we, that we correct this, that we get to the bottom of this, and that we do you know, justice to their memory. It, it is completely mind-boggling that, that a family in America today would send their sons and daughters off uh, to war in defense of this country, knowing full well what the dangers were with respect to, to combat and to you know, the situation over there, and then to have something like this, something like this, uh, electrocution, uh, happen is just uh, it's just extremely extremely sad uh, let me let me start uh, with mr. Bruni mr. Bruni I, I understand I, I'm also a construction manager which is why they they sent me over there uh, that was in my former life uh, you seem to be positing two choices here on inspection and one is you, you're authorized to inspect but then you need a further further authorization to, to make those corrections. Is that, is that what you're testifying to today, sir? Yes, sir, that is correct. But, sir, and, and believe me, I, I do not fault you in any way, but, sir, you know, in, in my experience, there's a third option. And, and once you discover a, a, a deficiency in a system, especially an electrical system, there is a latent danger in that system. And I know from my own experience as a construction manager that you can tie that off, that you can flag that, and that you can, you can require that that system not be used until it is corrected. Doesn't mean you have to correct it. Doesn't mean you have to be authorized to make the repairs. But you're protecting someone from, from using a system that is inherently dangerous. Uh, can I ask you why, why, why that option was not used here? I understand it was in, one in, in the first instance when the gentleman was was uh, electrocuted in, in 2004, there was actually a lock put on, which was the proper, proper way to handle this thing. Uh, and then someone got a key and unlocked that, and then, and then the tragedy occurred. But, and, and so I, I cannot fault the action taken by the, the authority in that, in that instance. However, in a lot of these other cases, I think there may have been an opportunity to, to tie this thing off, to shut it down, and to flag it so that someone else didn't come along and continue to use it. We have testimony here of one, one uh, fine young soldier who, who was shocked four or five times. Now, that, that, that in my mind is not acceptable and should not have happened. Can you, can you help the committee in understanding why this third option was not used? Well, sir, the, the decision to keep those soldiers in those facilities is made by the military. It's not made by KBR. And we finally reached the point in February where action was taken by the leadership at KBR with DCMA to actually sever uh, power and water connections to a number of buildings at the RPC and also working with the uh, military to, uh, to sure. establish Sir, when was that? I just want to make sure I understand. Sorry. When was that? When that, was that I decision it was finally February made? February of 2008. February of 2008. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. Did you want to? Do you want to say anything more on that? No, sir. I'm I'm finished. Thank you. Okay. The other the other thing that troubles me greatly is uh, I had a chance again to sit with uh, uh, Major General Tim McHale, and uh, there seems to be a, a a fairly coherent action plan this morning. After the deaths of 16 uh, of our of our best and bravest, uh, one uh, there was an assessment made that yeah we we went into a country that that had uh, terribly deficient electrical standards. Uh, it had an assortment of codes in place, uh, none of which, in my mind, really reached to the standard that we require in this country. But uh, notwithstanding that fact, we moved our folks into the, these, these buildings and uh, there, there was no really coherent uh, effort to, to bring those buildings up to standards in any meaningful way, not, not in a comprehensive way, maybe in a patchwork sort of fashion. And 
you know, it seems in hindsight, I realize in hindsight, it seems pretty basic that we should have done that. The second thing was there's no, there's no database. There was no database for these different units to understand the dangers that were being faced and the injuries and fatalities that were being uh, encountered uh, by, by some units elsewhere. And uh, those are just two basic things that we're going to do now, you know, thanks to, to General Tim McHale and some others. But why did it take 16 deaths to, to get to that point? Can anybody on the panel help me with that? Sir, I would just comment that I think this really, this whole, and this committee is interested in this and uh, the issues that have highlighted to me have pointed out that we do have a gap uh, from a doctrinal standpoint that when we do go to an operation and occupy buildings built by other uh, countries that don't meet our standards, what is our process? You know, who is making those decisions on what buildings we will utilize and which ones will be upgraded? And, uh, you know, I'm confident the department is going to have to go and tackle that. Uh, again, uh, um, it, to me, it's a gap. Uh, I, this has uh, been a long, protracted war. We've been occupying facilities that weren't built to U.S. standards, and I think we need to come up doctrinally with solutions on how do we do that in the future. Obviously, uh, General Petraeus has taken this very seriously, and so is Major General McHale, and they're tackling it now. Sir, if I, if I could just say in closing before I yield back, look, we've got a lot of situations over there right now. Some number of troops are going to be there for a while. And I've been to Afghanistan as well, and we've got a similar situation there. You guys got to get this. You got to get this right. You got to get this straightened out. And it shouldn't take a you know a work authorization to remove a dangerous situation. It should be just be assumed that if, if the contractor sees a dangerous situation, you flag it and you remove it, take it out of service, and then it would force the 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 contracting authority to authorize the changes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, Mr. Altmaier. Mr. Bruni, I recently met, as you know, with KBR CEO William Mutt, and during our conversation he informed me, and it's been reiterated today by both you and Mr. Parsons in your testimony, that KBR was not involved in any electrocutions except, uh, as far as maintenance, except for Staff Sergeant Maitz's incident. And I assume you would still agree with that? Yes, sir. So I want to turn to another incident that you referred to in your testimony, written testimony today. It involves the incident with Sergeant Christopher Everett, who was electrocuted in September 2005 when he was power washing a Humvee in a motor pool at Camp Altakadam. Now on page five in your written statement you say, and I quote, Though KBR did have a presence at Camp Altakadam, KBR had no responsibility for the maintenance of the power washer, the motor pool, or the generator that supplied power to the motor pool. So we've put in front of you a document, which I have here. It's too small to put up on the board, but it has two pieces to it. The first page here is a letter of technical direction dated January 5, 2005 fully nine months before Sergeant Everett was electrocuted. And in this letter, it asks DCMA, DCMA is tasking KBR with inspecting and maintaining all generators at Camp Altakadam that are shown on the attached spreadsheet, which is the second and third list. And if you go to the end of this list, five up from the bottom, you'll see the motor pool on there. So you can see that the generator at the motor pool is in fact included on this document. So it looks like KBR was in fact responsible for maintaining the generator that supplied power to the motor pool that contributed to the death of Sergeant Christopher Everett. So to give you a moment to review that document, would you agree with that? Excuse me, sir. Uh, it, does, it does list the generator, yes, sir, but it's our understanding that this particular generator did not power the motor pool. Rather, it was approximately one or 200 meters away from the motor pool. It did not power the motor pool. So do you 
given that, and we will reference that at the committee, do you want to revise your statement earlier when you said KBR had no responsibility for the maintenance of the power wash or the motor pool or the generator that supplied power to the motor pool? No, sir, I do not. You stand by that? Yes, sir. Well, we would hope that you would review these documents yes, sir. Uh, a little bit more closely and, and we'll return to this subject. Yes, sir. The next question, following the death of my constituent, Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth, the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, which from my understanding has authority over U.S. Special Forces soldiers and Iraqi Special Soldiers, Forces soldiers in Iraq, sent teams of electricians out to inspect and repair all facilities under its command. Additionally, on January 21, 2008, the report states that following the death of Staff Sergeant Maseth, DCMA funded KBR to fix hazards throughout Sergeant Maseth's compound. While I commend the Special Forces and DCMA for taking these steps to protect our nation's Special Forces troops, I wonder if similar steps have been taken to protect Americans not serving under this command. So I would say to Mr. Hiddell, have you determined in your review if similar steps have been taken by other military commands throughout Iraq? Um, sir, we know that there have been actions taken since January the 2nd uh, after Sergeant Mesa's death. And some of those actions were undertaken by the uh, multinational core Iraq and others were fo followed approximately a month later by the uh, multinational um, forces Iraq. I can, I can be spe more specific if you would like. Um, it, would that be helpful in terms of exactly what, was, what has been done? Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to, in my brief time, also follow up with Mr. Williams very quickly, okay. if, I, if I could, <clears throat> on the same subject. Uh, has the DCMA provided additional funding to KBR so that they may, at the very least, perform repairs on all facilities known to have deficiencies? Congressman, uh, I would say that DCMA uh, obviously uh, orders the contractor or directs the contractor based on funding that comes from the Army uh, or the multinational core based on their prioritization efforts. Uh, to the extent that DCMA has been uh, given that funding to apply to the contract, I'm, uh, I'm sure that that has occurred. Uh, I, would, I would also observe that uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, General Petraeus uh, is, is looking at this very seriously is because it's a theater-wide issue. And in many cases, there are facilities that do not fall up under uh, the particular contract that DCM may have authority over. So there are those facilities that still are outside of the the range of the contract, and I think that's why General uh, McHale has taken a closer look theater-wide. Thank you, and I thank the chairman for allowing me to participate today. Thank you, Mr. Altmaier. Uh, Mr. Brady? Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for very much for allowing me to participate in this hearing today. Uh, you're right, this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. I appreciate, appreciate uh, the leadership of uh, yourself, uh, Congressman Altmaier, Senator Casey, and Senator Corn of Texas uh, on this issue. Uh, losing one American life uh, and one soldier's life to faulty grounding is unacceptable. Continuing to lose more is, uh, is unforgivable. In our case, my constituent, Ms. Lorraine McGee of Huntsville, Texas, lost her son, Staff Sergeant Christopher Everett. He was killed in Iraq September 7, 2005, when he was electrocuted by an improperly grounded power washer as he washed down a Humvee. And in Chris's death, we lost a promising 23-year-old National Guardsman who had a bright future and came from a very loving family. Uh, who wants answers to that death? His mom was uh, led to believe this was the first death by electrocution. Turns out it was uh, by then at least the fourth, and it has continued to happen. And we know war is dangerous and death occurs in those struggles, but you don't expect death to come from a swimming pool or a shower or a car wash. And to date, uh, we have 16 deaths a number of them due to contact with power lines, which raises other questions. But to date, uh, we have seven known deaths attributed to improperly grounded electrical devices. And if KBR is responsible for that, then the company should have the book thrown at it. But my frustration is I cannot seem to determine who is responsible for installing that equipment and maintaining it. And so I want to ask those who ought to know our Army representatives. We talked about Staff Sergeant Maseth, but earlier than that, Sergeant uh, Michael Montpettit, 
was killed in Baghdad, electrocuted while working on a generator at his camp. To our Army representatives, Mr. Williams, Mr. Parsons, Mr. Uh, Hadell, in that case, who installed that equipment, that generator, and who was responsible for maintaining it? Do you know? Are you asking me, sir? All three of you. Uh, from Inspector General's point of view, we, we are try attempting to find out, but we do not know the Don't answer know. to that. Don't know? Sir, I do not know the answer Don't to that either. No, sir, I do not know. Thank you. In, in uh, 2005, uh, Sar Staff Sergeant Christopher Everett was killed, electrocuted power washer. Who installed that motor pool, that power washer? Who was responsible for maintaining it? Do you know? I do not know, sir. Sir, I do not know either. No, sir. In 2004, Corporal Marcos Nolasco was electrocuted while showering in his base in Baji. Do you know who installed that shower and who was responsible for maintaining it? Again, Mr. Brady, uh, the, this is a question we are attempting to pursue and will continue, but we do not know the answer. Private First Class Brian Cutter killed in al uh, electrocuted while working on trying to fix the AC unit outside his tent. Do we know? who installed that AC unit and who was responsible for maintaining it? The Inspector General's office does not know, sir. Specialist Chase Whitman killed in Mosul, electrocuted while just swimming in a pool. Do we know who installed that pool and who was responsible for maintaining it? No, Same sir. Same answer? No, sir. We are pursuing that. Finally, Specialist Marvin uh, Campos Siles, uh, may have mispronounced that, killed in as early as April 2004, four and a half years ago, coalition base near Samara electrocuted while working on generators. Well, do we know, does the Army know um, who installed the generator and who was responsible for maintaining it? Mr. Brady, um, on all of those that you cited, um, the investigations conducted by um, Army CID and uh, NCIS, we have reviewed those, and I believe that I can state accurately that that uh, based on our review of those investigations, we, we do not know the answers to your, your questions. And I guess my frustration is it has been four and a half years since the first death. Why don't we know? Why does not the Army know who installed those, that equipment in those deaths and who was responsible for maintaining them? Why don't we know now? This investigation, I know, I know we've sent letters, and I've spoken personally to Secretary Gates. I know Congressman Altmaier. I know the chairman has as well. This is not a new issue. You know, why don't we know now who put those facilities in and who was responsible for maintaining them? If you're asking me, sir, uh, I don't know why we do not know, but I do know that Almost every question that we're addressing here today comes down to an issue of, of leadership. But those questions should have answers, but they don't at this time. Mr. Parsons? Sir, I can't explain why there's not answers to those questions, and I've asked the same ones that you have. Um, again, that's why I'm working with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers to try to understand the scope of the requirement, the contracts that they had in place and what they were, ma what their contractors were maintaining. Um, this, you know, no excuse, but it's a complex issue. Uh, we're talking 80-some thousand facilities just under log cap alone, um, and, but I don't have a good answer on why those types of strings weren't pulled at the time of the accident. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, sure you, the department, will continue to work with the DODIG to, to uh, figure that out. And I understand how complex Iraq is and Afghanistan. I understand that. But I would think the red flag occurred four and a half years ago. It, would not, it, it should be a focus for our country to find out why that occurred. So my question, follow-up question is, when will we know? When will you get back to this committee with the answers of who who installed and who maintained in, in those deaths specifically? Sir, I will have to get you back to you on a timeline uh, on uh, when we think we'll actually have all that information. Inspector General. Sir, we anticipate uh, completing our review of this by October of this year. To an October, and will it include specifically who was responsible? We're going to try. We're going to try. We're attempting to answer every question that you've asked, sir, and I hope that our report contains that. Mr. Chair, and it needs to. It needs to. And again, um, uh, we need to hold account. One, we need to fix the problem that's occurring today. And two, we need to find out who and hold accountable who did it. And my frustration is we cannot seem to get the answers that I think 
uh, our soldiers and their moms deserve. Mr. Chairman, I have two questions that Mrs. McGee, uh, Chris Everett's mom, asked me to ask. Would you like me to submit that in writing to KBR? If, if you wouldn't mind, we would like you to submit it in writing and get a response for the Great. Record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Brady. I, I want to th thank Mr. Brady for the questions he asked and all the other members of this panel because from what I've heard from the witnesses before us, there's a lot we don't know that we should know. And yet last night, uh, there was a fellow named Jeff Morrill, who's the Pentagon press secretary, and he called a press conference to say about our hearing for today, there seems to be a misperception out there that our facilities in the, that theater are replete with electrical hazards that have caused hundreds of fires and multiple fatalities, end quote. And Mr. Morrill went on to say, it's flat out wrong to suggest that there has been a lack of oversight by the Pentagon. Uh, I, I find that incredible, that he would, he would say he knows that it's an overblown issue. Well, it's not an overblown issue uh, to, uh, to Cheryl Harris when she's trying to find out the truth for her son and what happened to him. It's not an overblown issue for the family of Corporal Marcus Nolasco when their son's death, who was also electrocuted while taking a shower, and they're trying to find out the answers about that. It's certainly not overblown for the family of Petty Officer David Sedegren, who was electrocuted in the shower. Specialist Chase Whitham was electrocuted in a swimming pool. Their families don't think these risks are overblown. And I have to say that while there's a lot of things we don't know, as soon as, uh, as um, Staff Sergeant Ryan Messeth was killed, the Army said they knew how he died. They told his mother he must have brought in some electrical appliance into the shower with her. Well, I, I just hope that all of you, when you go back to the Pentagon, that uh, you tell the uh, people there after this hearing that the press secretary ought to stop trying to spin these facts away and start looking out for the health and safety of our troops. We expect people to know what has happened to hold people accountable for what they did and the most important thing is to make sure it doesn't happen again. But I can't say after this hearing that I feel assured that uh, the Pentagon, KBR, the Inspector General, or any of you are on top of this situation. It's all an interim report still being worked on. Let's find out the answers. This committee didn't supply them. I'm disappointed. But we still insist on getting those answers, and we're going to continue to press from the congressional side, and we hope the Pentagon will continue to press as well on the military side. I thank all of you for your participation, and particularly the two guests for our committee, our two colleagues that joined us. We very much appreciate your being here. That uh, completes the business of the hearing, and we stand adjourned. President Bush signed an HIV-AIDS relief bill into law yesterday.